Hey you all, Farmer Jesse here. So we have this saying in farming and it goes, just keep planting. Yeah, that's the whole of the saying. The idea here though, is that in the peak of summer, you're so tired, you're so incredibly hot and you've got a mountain of work to do, but the only thing you have to do is get food in the ground. Otherwise, you'll look up in August or September and have absolutely nothing to sell or if you're a gardener to eat. Uh, so I wanted to do a quick video about getting crops in the ground, even sensitive crops like lettuce or beets, but also tomatoes and soon fall crops and anything you may be directly sowing at the height of summer. So we'll talk about planting and sowing and we'll discuss some heat mitigation strategies and I'll make some unnecessary digressions like usual. So let's do it. First things first, if you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. And if you gain something from this video or any of our videos or any of our podcasts or anything else we do, you can always support our work at patreon.com slash no-till growers or by picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook directly from notillgrowers.com where the proceeds go to making you more content like this. All right, so summertime. Uh, we tend to think of summer as this bountiful period of the year um, flowing with food and that's true or it can be but the reality is especially for us southern growers and people in much hotter climates than Kentucky zone 6b where I am uh, many if not most vegetables just straight up hate the summer uh, very few things that we produce truly like to grow in temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees Celsius or 305 degrees Kelvin no one uses Kelvin Scientists use Kelvin. You got something against scientists? A lot of growers in the deep south don't even bother farming in the heat of the summer uh, because yields and productivity dive with the increased heat. It's harder to get crops in. It's not fun to work in those conditions. And by not fun, I mean sometimes outright dangerous. But for those of us who have to or can plant in the summer, there are a range of things you can do to ensure success. First, let's get a little overview of what's happening to most vegetable plants when it's hot. If you don't care about the basic science here, you can just skip to this time here. Wow, I talk for that long. I'm gonna get some comments about that. But I feel like this context is super helpful because it will provide some insight into why I suggest what I do suggest. And also I am a big plant biology nerd, so I can't help but wanna talk about it. So your goal is always photosynthesis. The better the photosynthetic efficacy, that is to say the more efficiently your plants can use water, sunlight, carbon dioxide, and nutrients to create things like leaves and roots and to feed the soil, the better everything will go for you from your yields to the plant's natural pest and disease suppression. Just all the things go better when the plant is photosynthesizing well. In fact, if I can impart one thing on you as a grower, it's that your job is to manage photosynthesis, you know, and you should try to have a basic understanding of what it is and how it works. That's what we as growers do. We don't grow anything. We manage the plant's ability to photosynthesize. And plants have to stay cool in order to properly do that. How they keep their literal cool is through a few different ways. One is called transpiration. Think of it like uh, sweating sort of for plants. Anyway, so long as the plant has adequate access to water, it can release a little bit through the tiny holes in the leaves called stomata. These are the same tiny holes that allow carbon dioxide to diffuse into the plant, which is an important fact that will come up later. It's really important to reiterate that if the soil does not have adequate moisture, the plants can't do this transpiration thing or cooling off. And if the plant senses that it doesn't have enough moisture at the roots, it will shut those tiny holes in the leaves, the stomata, to preserve it. This is not great on many levels. One, the plants are not cooling themselves off, but two, that also means that the plants are no longer allowing CO2 in or pulling nutrients up into the plant from the soil because transpiration is not just about cooling the plants off. This is the process that allows the plant to defy gravity and essentially pull nutrients from the soil into the plants, almost like a siphon. Uh, the end result here is poor photosynthesis, but that's not all. Oh no, I'm not done yet. Get away from me. Typically what happens in photosynthesis is that the carbon dioxide is taken up from the air and through a deeply elegant process, that gaseous carbon is turned into glucose. That's an oversimplification obviously, but that process is how plants store energy, the glucose from the sun to use for, like I said, making leaves and roots and exudates for soil organisms and everything plants need. Photorespiration, however, is when the Rubisco enzyme, and don't worry about that jargon, they're 
the rubisco is just an enzyme and enzymes are like little matchmakers rubisco is key to photosynthesis and also fun fact the most abundant enzyme on the planet but photorespiration is when the rubisco enzyme the matchmaker starts fixing oxygen instead of carbon which is generally not great because plants are carbon based and they need to fix carbon to be productive uh, this photorespiration has some necessity for plants, not all of which is totally understood as far as I know, but we do know that too much photorespiration can greatly slow down plant productivity, and it is a process that is much more likely to occur when those stomata are closed and the levels of carbon dioxide in the leaves is depleted while the levels of oxygen go up. Why do the stomata close? Well, more often than not, it's water, or a lack thereof. They close to preserve what water the plant has left. So. That's where we will leave the science behind, more or less, for the moment, and get rejoined by our skippers that hit the time, and start on some more technical stuff. All right, so summer success starts with seed, and then maybe a little bit of alliteration, especially when it comes to sensitive crops, like lettuce, um, but also things like carrots. Heat-tolerant seed is kind of important. It's kind of critical for lettuce. Uh, your winter and spring varieties of stuff are not necessarily going to fly in the summertime, and you may have to just let go of certain crops like spinach if your summers are consistently above that 80 degree Fahrenheit mark for long stretches. Note that altitude is also important for seed. If you're growing in high altitude, contact a high altitude seed producer, like for instance our buddies at Wild Mountain Seeds, who are adapting crops to intense summer sunlight in the high Rocky Mountains. Also, make sure you are hitting and not terribly exceeding the given germination temperatures for each crop when you're starting them. I'm not going to list those here, but you can usually find the guidance for that from your seed purveyors. Um, for transplanting crops, what we do on our farm is start by hardening plants off. That is to say, we take them out of the greenhouse and leave them in direct sunlight for several days. Um, you will see a color and even texture change in the plant as it develops its sort of sunblock, which are just various phytonutrients that protect the plant from sun exposure. Um, keep watering these plants, these hardening off plants is normal, but that direct sunlight is like a transplant boot camp, getting them ready for the harsh reality of the big garden. Obviously, water management is key. I say obviously because the science I just outlined in case you skipped ahead and you're like, this is an odd segue. Anyway, no matter what you're planting in the summer or how you're doing it, water is going to be absolutely critical. It's paramount. When it's a drier period, we will water the bed the evening before we plant to replant it. Uh, then we will transplant early in the morning and water heavily to get the crop, maybe lettuce, but it could be beets or green onions or whatever, to get the crop established as quickly as possible. We also do that same thing when we're direct seeding. We get the bed wet the night before if we can, and then we direct seed in the morning. That doesn't always work out that way. You don't want it too wet when you're direct seeding because it'll clog up your seeder, but you do want some moisture in the bed before you get your seeds in there. So we always make sure the irrigation is placed to sustain it. We always try to avoid transplanting into dry soil as well because it's, it's just really hard to resaturate that on a hot day. After transplanting, we cover the bed with shade cloth for about a week, but at least a few days while the plants get settled, especially those sensitive crops. During that time, we were also misting the plants um, over top of the shade cloth. When the temperatures are high, say anything above 85 degrees Fahrenheit, many plants will suffer and misting alone will not always work. I definitely sacrificed those lettuce plants for demonstration's sake and not just because I, my shade cloth wasn't long enough. Totally. I do a whole summer lettuce breakdown in this video here, so make sure to give that a watch for more insight on this uh, lettuce and other sensitive crops. For larger crops like tomatoes or crops like beets, we try not to mist them as we do the smaller crops like lettuce because the risk of leaf diseases is so high on those crops. Um, for those, it's all about establishment. When we plant our later tomatoes, for instance, uh, we will dig a hole, fill that hole with water, usually with some microbially rich compost involved, uh, and then plant the tomatoes so they go into a nice moist spot. Um, if it's already moist, we will just add a little moistened compost before the transplants go in. Just make sure to get moisture at the base of the plant is what I'm kind of getting at here. Always, always make sure the soil on the transplants themselves is soaking wet before you transplant as well. Um, planting a dry transplant is just asking for trouble and, and death. Do any summer transplanting as quickly as you possibly can, and once it gets too hot, stop transplanting. 
get the misters on and or get it covered with a shade cloth pronto if you have to finish the planting in the evening or early the next day putting a plant into hot soil with hot sun above them is not a recipe for success though admittedly some of those longer season crops like tomatoes if you are still planting them will do fine on that note, it's mid-June here now, and many of us could probably still sneak in a round of determinate tomatoes, which are faster, depending on where you're located and what your lows are like. Um, if you don't have or don't want to use shade cloth, just about anything can work, but no matter what you use, it cannot be touching the plant. If the material gets too hot right against the plant, it will burn the plant. We use these nine gauge wire hoops that were originally made for 30 inch beds, so they're like 54 inches long, I think, but if, I was going to do them for my 48 inch beds. I would probably make them like 72 or 75 inches long. And I just use a wire cutter to cut them. Again, there are other materials you could use just so long as they don't trap heat or touch the plant. So no row cover unless it is fully suspended above the plant and not holding any heat in. Heat, especially heat at night, is harder on plants than sunlight generally is. We don't use shade cloth on our tomatoes and cucumbers and such, but if we were much further south than Kentucky, we honestly probably would. And in fact, I may have just lied to you because although we don't use shade cloth on those above crops, we do use things like tunnels. Planting in tunnels is really great for shade, as long as the airflow is high because the plastic emulates shade cloth or tree cover. And indeed, for a more natural approach, you could consider having a summer plot in a partial shaded area, like under some trees or shrubs or tall annuals or a building or whatever. Um, beets and lettuce and carrots will grow pretty well under a sparse planting of trees in the middle of the summer. Um, but back to the tunnels, air movement is critical there. For air movement for us, we take the end walls off of our cat tunnels, like you can see right there, and we built our Rimmel high tunnel to have a ridge vent, the length of the tunnel, and to have very high hip boards. So again, the plastic acts more like a shade cloth in the summer than a heat trap because we're releasing all that heat. Then we close the sides and the air vent in the winter to trap the heat. Nifty things, those high tunnels. I've seen where some people extend shade cloth over their gardens, and I get that idea. It's very, actually, probably necessary in certain climates. Most things will grow fine with 30% shade and some crops in some areas may outright need it. 30% shade is what I was using on our shade cloth, by the way. High altitude growers may sometimes use shade cloth, not necessarily to cool the crops, but because the intensity of the sun is so great in high altitudes. I do a lot of interplanting as well through the spring, which adds a little shade for smaller crops, but I don't necessarily do much interplanting midsummer because I don't like to mist crops like tomatoes, so I can't plant lettuce that needs misting below them. Green onions are a good option though, as are many things like basil, or you probably have a lot of other ideas for that. You could also maybe do some beans or some parsley, or you could do a lot of different stuff. Maybe a short list of crops who love, you know, that hot, hot weather is in order. Okra. Okay, and there are some others uh, such as sweet corn and field corn. Beans do fairly well as long as they are, you know, they get that reasonable amount of moisture. Uh, same thing for squashes, winter squash, summer squash. Uh, I've had good, some good success with late pota potatoes as well, as long as they are nicely mulched with a cool colored mulch like straw or hay. I also really love growing sweet potatoes and they are fairly heat and drought tolerant, though they don't love drying out. Here in Kentucky, we generally get enough rain throughout the season to dry farm all those crops, but you may not. Uh, there are also things like Malabar spinach, which I do not have any experience with, except for I ate it once and it was delicious. Feel free to list your heat tolerant summer varieties and in the comment section. And, you know, always feel free to touch on anything I miss or I get wrong. Some quick notes on direct seeding. Uh, you know, we do like summer, fall, and winter carrots. Um, those things often have to be sown in the heat. So one thing that we will do, um, you know, in beets too and other crops. So one of the things that we'll do is we'll sow it preferably into lightly moistened soil. Um, and then we will uh, get that very wet, either with drip tape or with, as in this shot, you can see I'm like really, really soaking this bed because it's very, it's 100 degrees when I'm shooting this video. Um, but soak that bed really, really well. And then you'll pull a, either a double layer of row cover. So it's not trying to hold it in. It's actually trying to block out the sun. So a double layer of thick row cover or you can also stretch over it a plastic tarp with the white side up to kind of ref reflect the light but hold in that humidity. You don't wanna leave that on for too long and the goal will ultimately be to 
uh, germinate the crops and then get that tarp off before they're really, really up. The second that you see a sprout, you really want to take that off. I mentioned that in the beet video and I mentioned it in the carrot video, I think, and also probably in other videos, but it will dramatically speed up the process of germination and also get you better germination on those directly seeded crops. When they're coming up out of the ground, when they're just germinating, take that tarp off at night so they don't get burned up by the sun and also consider misting them a little bit. That will also help. Last thing I will briefly mention is that if water is such an important factor, then obviously mulches can come in quite handy. Uh, we use a fair amount of mulch on our farm in the form of cover crop residue, like I talk about in this video, but also hay, leaves, and mulching composts, all of which I really break down thoroughly in the Living Soil Handbook and in other videos on this channel. Of course, always be employing all the things that help build soil organic matter in your garden, which will help retain moisture. Not to turn this last little bit into a resource guide, but watch this playlist here on the four basic principles of soil health for some guidance on that, or just keep your soil planted as much as possible with a diversity of plants, uh, keep it covered as much as possible with mulches and disturb it as little as you possibly can. That will help to build up your soil's natural ability to retain moisture. Uh, lastly, I just want to, didn't I just say lastly? Second to lastly, I just want to touch on fall crops uh, because I find our region, these are really hard to establish, just spe you know, specifically the brassicas. Our approach here is to keep the transplants covered with insect netting for most of their growth in trays to avoid early pest damage from flea beetles, harlequin beetles, cabbage moths, and the whole slew of brassica loving pests we get here. Then when they are big enough, we harden those crops off outside. Uh, we again make sure the bed is moist, add a little wet compost to each transplant hole, make sure the transplants themselves are wet, and then we pray. If we have insect netting available, we will cover them. And this is the only crop that if I see a lot of caterpillar eggs, I will apply some Bacillus thuringiensis or BT, which is a bacteria that explodes the caterpillars. Yep. Um, long season brassicas tend to be very hard for us because they need to be planted in August when it's still blazing hot here. Kales and the like are a bit easier because you get to plant them a little bit later. And a little shade cloth can also help reduce the stress on those as well. And like I said, a little insect netting like this is a good idea with one caveat, it's thin but it does still retain some heat. So if you can at all mist these crops, it's a good idea. Um, the other caveat there is that it's kind of expensive. Anyway, I said a quick video and then promptly failed to do a quick video. So like this video if you like this video. Make sure you are subscribed to this channel. Support our work if you can at all at patreon.com slash no-till growers or pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook from no-tillgrowers.com specifically to help support more videos like this. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. Mm -hmm.